afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Good, the Bad and the Ugly webinar on safety reps and committees and workforce. Um, a few housekeeping things first of all. Um, if you're asking questions, please use the questions in the panel on your screen. If your questions have not been answered, you will be contacted directly. When using polls, these will automatically come up on your screen and they'll be self-explanatory. Uh, Emily is going to be facilitating this today so all your questions will come through her and she'll direct them to me and I will then put them to the panel. I may answer some myself. My name is Shane Gorman, I'm the Workforce Engagement Coordinator at Step Change and Safety. I've been doing this job about six weeks now um, and I'm looking for offshore visits so I'm going to shamelessly promote that. If anybody wants me to come to their work site, uh, visit in terms of workforce engagement or to help with safety committees, um, then I am here. Please get in touch with Step Change and uh, we, can, we can sort that out for you. Um, so, going on from that, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What does it look like? Lamont, good, Malloy, bad, Egan, he is ugly. <laughs> Short. Yeah. Unfortunately, Vicky, short. unfortunately, Vicky couldn't be with us today, um, but uh, we've got myself and Aileen there, so we'll be able to help with these uh, standing for her. Um, so, without further ado, we've got uh, Jake Malloy from RMT and the Vice Chairman of the Offshore Coordinating Group of Trade Unions. Bob Egan, the HSC Workforce Engagement and Co-Chair of West. And Aileen Woodger, Health and Safety Instructor for Pitch Factory 9. Thank you very much. Uh, what we'd like to do first of all is get Aileen to uh, talk about how she sees the good, the bad and the ugly from a training point of view and from the delegates that she speaks to um, on a weekly basis. So Aileen, if you'd like to take us through that, I'm sure that'll give us plenty of talking points to be getting on with. Okay, uh, so starting off with what we see from delegates when they come into the training courses. The, the good, uh, we see lots of delegates who have very positive attitudes towards safety and certainly a willingness to participate in all the activities that we cover so they can learn how to be effective safety reps. And certainly a lot of enthusiasm as well at the end of the course where people are prepared to go out and really put into practice what they've learned. However, it's not all good. From a bad point of view, uh, we've, we're seeing some delegates who are only receiving their initial training more than six months after their election, which makes it difficult for them to know what they're supposed to be doing. And in addition to that, some supervisors who are taking on the role because actually nobody on the workforce wishes to stand. And then there's, of course, the downright ugly. Uh, we find that a lot of night shift workers are not being able to attend any safety committee meetings because they're held mid-morning every time. And we get a few delegates who are quite disinterested, to, disinterested they're not really willing to get involved and, and may only actually be there to be paid while they're on shore. So that's what we see, what we hear from our delegates, particularly when they come back on their refreshers. Uh, the good looks like uh, I've been given plenty of time when I need to research things for my constituents. And uh, one was I've successfully negotiated a shorter day for workers who've arrived on a late flight, which has reduced tiredness. Again, it's not all good, so uh, the ban looks like I was not nominated or seconded by anyone. The OIM just told me I was the safety rep. Uh, we don't have a joint email address for safety reps. And what ties in with that then is that they've never seen the HSE inspection agenda before they arrive offshore. And then from the ugly perspective, we had one delegate recently who said, I'm only on this course because the OIM told the previous guy he was no longer a safety rep. And in addition to that, I've not been allowed to go on any additional training to support me in my role. So that's what we are hearing from the delegates. Thanks, Aileen. I, I think that gives us an awful lot of discussion points. And we'll, we'll start with uh, <laughs> the good, the bad and the ugly. But if you could send in your questions on what you think good looks like, if you could do that now, please, that would be very helpful. And meanwhile, we'll discuss what we think good looks like. And uh, we'll start with this. Um, all these words here, so organised and open. We start with organised. I mean, who, who organises the safety committees and who um, who do you think should organise them and how are they organised uh, on installations? Jake, you, you're on next step. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I'm going back a lot of years when I was safety rep, but they were organised by the safety reps. The safety reps took owner support. 
think that's the, the key aspect of it, that you, you take ownership of it and you organise yourselves. And, you know, you can, you can support each other as well as support the workforce. I mean, we had things like the uh, delegated rep for the trips that would do all the inductions or the, um, the rep that did all the activity and the updates on the minutes, um, distributed the minutes, did the boards, um, a duty safety rep or something like that. And I think that builds into the group of safety reps confidence and support and you then begin to share openly your knowledge and, and uh, training and everything else. But for me, it's no rocket science. You look at the regulations, the regulations, specifically regulation 16 and 17, the powers and the functions. If you can look to adapt them and use them, you'll be delivering a good, good safety rep. Do you feel it's a bit momentum? Well, uh, <clears throat> well, you get momentum through once once it gets organised, once it gains ownership, once reps and the workforce, more than reps specifically, are going and putting items on the agenda at a safety committee level, they're then challenging each other. I mean, I would see uh, good momentum would be within a safety committee and even if you're having them uh, at least every three months, challenging each other to go and do inspections on major acts and hazards. Now, once this starts getting momentum and gets going and working, then it does create its own uh, momentum. It's like creating integrity, can't yeah. it? Uh, and the workforce see that integrity. They see that they've got, they get benefit from their committee and then they believe in it and start, if things start to happen. Do you think that? In your experience, yeah. it's good to be involved in things that are good and when things are happening and results are uh, coming in, and that's from all levels, uh, then it is a good thing and it certainly gets things moving. And that's when you start gaining elections as safety reps. Mm -hmm. That's another thing of where it's working well, you'll have people standing against each other because people want to be involved in good things. Yeah. Emily's got a question, I think. Yeah, we've got a question in. Can the panel explain the importance of a good election process and the pitfalls of press ganging a safety rep? Okay. Um, Bob, I think it's probably the best well, to answer that. A good election process, uh, there's different ways. Uh, on large contracts, right, uh, you can have elections within the regulations before people go offshore. You know, that's good when you're maybe coming in, uh, uh, there's no so many hookups now, but in, in large contracts offshore or decommissioning. So when a large amount of contractors are coming on board, we'll have safety reps there. Safety reps are amongst them. Uh, otherwise, the election process, get it on the board early, uh, get people notified, involved in it, information on good things of being a safety rep and then and then using that. I think there's the the democratic thrust of it as well oh, well I've always supported because if you've if you're having an election, I mean we're, we're gonna want to do a general election. We'll get into that. But um, mm -hmm. but if you've if you're having a genuine election process, the workforce feel empowered to elect the individual they think is going to represent them best. And that gives them that engagement, that involvement as well. I mean, we used to do the old posters and the, you know, the hustings. You used to go to safety meetings and, and do your presentation um, to the constituency that, we, that you were standing for. Um, just as we're, we're seeing today with Mrs May and Mr Cordner and everybody else, it's, it's that engagement and that empowerment of the workforce improves things as well. Yeah, sure. I think we'll deal with the press gang part and the ugly, if you don't mind. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what else are we looking for? I mean, knowledge. I guess that comes from training. What's good training look like? How, how, how do you find your when you're given your training? How do um, you find the? the yeah. Knowledge? Well, well, obviously, um, the the workforce themselves who come in on these training courses, they know a lot more about how things work offshore than I do. I think when they come on the safety rep trainings, but under them learning what they're actually supposed to be doing, learning what their functions and, and powers are, um, and how they can use that effectively, I, I suppose that's the, the best the best way of putting that from a training perspective. 
um, but, but also that they need to be given additional support training if they need investigation training, if they want to be involved in investigations, and they, they have to be supported in that, otherwise they, they can't do it effectively, really. Yeah, there's, uh, there's actually, I mean, what we did, because we didn't have the, the well, I was doing safety reps, I'm talking about the, the mid-90s, um, we didn't have the new courses that you've got, the, the development courses. What we did, we got it on site. You know, I mean, if you if you go as a safety rep, we, the, as they are now, the independent competent person, the verification authorities, or even the platform inspectors, and you go around with them, you learn from them on the job. Yes. And it enables you to go out and do an inspection. You go out with good investigation teams, you learn investigation skills. So you, you, there's a lot of learning that you can do on site, but then that needs good management. But it also needs good safety reps, doesn't well, it? You need, you need the rep to, to volunteer and the rep to say, can I come on this and, and, and be, be active about it all, is it? You know, yes. it's not just about being approached and being told to do something, it's about being active and that, being that. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely do tell them that it doesn't have to be a formal PTO approved training course, although that's great for, for um, having our certificate, but an in-house training course uh, or a genetic training course or on, on-site training is perfectly adequate yeah. in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. I mean, a good thing as well that the, a lot of the inspectors do now is invite the safety reps to join them do, during their HSE inspection, yeah. uh, because that opens the doors to a lot more questions, no, a lot more information. Yeah. And let's say a good thing as well when that kind of thing happens is anything HSE tells safety reps is to share. It's no specifically that's a lot. We'll just tell you. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. to share with the workforce. Mm-hmm. Safety reps are the avenue for HSE to get into the workforce, and that's what HSE have to do as part of the Health and Safety and Work Act to inform and share the information with the workforce. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to run a poll question now. So uh, the first one of the afternoon: Do you feel the safety rep or committee system enhances safety at your place of work? So you've got three answers here. One, yes. Two, no. Three, what committee? So if you could go for that now, we'll just discuss what we think about that. I mean, I, I think from my experience, three and a half years as a safety rep, it definitely did. You know, I don't think there's any question about that. But for me, anyway, uh, this, our safety committee was incredibly active and we, we were very good uh, being a committee, or from what I understood a committee to be. So um, I don't know what it is. Well, did you have any negative experience, or what, what did good look like where you were? Well, the good thing, uh, especially with the committee, was when the reps uh, took charge, provided the agenda for inspections, uh, where I first was a safety rep for uh, about three years. Uh, we were then empowered to go and do our inspections and give reports back to the duty holder, which highlighted quite a lot of issues mm-hmm. and another good thing is even just asking the questions getting the questions known because nobody could go and look under every bit of insulation to see what the corrosion is like but you could ask the question is when was it last looked under mm-hmm. when was it last inspected and that uh, brings in like what jake said about the independent competent person going out and uh, uh, verification uh, part of that so you don't have to physically do every inspection or get involved in every inspection, but if you could question when they were done, that then uh, brings it further on the yeah. further yeah. line. People get it noticed. I spent, I spent show my age of what you like, but uh, I spent 10 years without safety and safety device option. And the difference in the regs introduced that was in November 89, um, was night and day yeah. because before you had safety reps, safety device, you turned up on a Sunday afternoon to be told what was happening, and there was nothing, there was no two way communication. There was, you were told that's how it is, that's how it happens. Scars, incidents, accidents, investigations, forget it, it just didn't happen, it just yeah. did not happen. So, yeah, huge and improvement, and a huge improvement, yeah. but it's, it's only going to be as good as people that get involved in the system. Yes. Results are in. Results are in. 68% yes, 11% no, 21% what safety comes Really, 21? 
think I put them as a no. Okay, maybe I need a visit to those places then. Yeah. But that that doesn't surprise me. Uh, as part of uh, the work we do within HSC, the Safety Committee Offshore is quite a lot of times uh, an undervalued tool that could be getting used offshore, but it's part of the regulations and we will inspect against the Safety Committee just as much as we'll inspect against safety events. And that legislation is there to be followed and you can't just pick and choose the bits you want. Mm -hmm. So uh, a good safety committee is worth its weight in gold and as we spoke about earlier, it will create its own momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Quite interesting, sorry, uh, just to, to find out what the 11% voted no um, actually meant by that. We'll put something out to, to try and find that out and we'll do some investigation. That's a really interesting poll, actually. So what, what I'd like to do now is move on from good um, to bad. So if you could send your questions in of what you think bad is, what does bad look like where you are? And we'll have a little chat around these various words that we've got here. So uncommitted. I think we touched on that a minute ago, you know, where you've got passive committees that just and passive reps that don't really get involved in things, they don't ask to go in inspections, they don't ask to go out and, and things and I think that's that's an easy trap to fall into, I think, you know, because and it's difficult I guess for some reps, because you go on the training courses and then you're expected when you get back to your place of work, you're supposed to be a trained rep. So you're supposed to just get right into it and be a rep. And I think that's where we've tried to, you know, look at the training. Bob Big West has, has done a lot of work on that, so maybe you want to me. Yeah, well, part of that uh, was people coming out of training and then that was it. They were just going back to their day job uh, and safety rep was just, if somebody came up and asked them a question, they'd try and get involved and try and answer because we felt they weren't walking away with enough support, enough tools to put into practice in what good looks like uh, uh, in being, being a safety representative. And just certainly looking at all these, all these words here, uh, one of the worst things that I think uh, on the bad side is unsupported and then value for money to your constituents, to your family, to your employers cost a lot of money to put safety reps through training and it's not good if they just come out and do not uh, do nothing and that's no good for your constituents ultimately uh, for your employers as well who have invested heavily uh, in you being a safety rep so part of that then is it's bad if you're not getting supported or you're certainly not getting the time uh, you're not getting the training at all, which I come across. Uh, there's certain time limits, uh, uh, like minimum delay for safety reps to be trained, and it should not be going on. Uh, you mentioned six months. You can double that, you can treble that with some of the things we come across in safety reps receiving no training. So that's bad. Emily? I've got a question in and it says our project end date is constantly moving and as a consequence of this we've received no further training apart from the initial course. Therefore is further training mandatory? Further training is, is not mandatory but because uh, it's no mandatory because safety reps do not have duties. And safety reps not having duties is what separates safety reps from management that we'll maybe come on later. Uh, but if you train it, if safety refs feel they require further training uh, for them to carry out their functions, then they should be entitled to further training. And training of safety refs should be on every safety committee uh, agenda and discussed. So that that's what's mandatory. It should be discussing safety ref training and workforce safety training. Get it raised, get it recorded. But if you don't get the training, talk to the HSC. Or me, what? give me a shoot. <laughs>
following on from that question, we've had a, another one. The HSC get very little time to do their inspections offshore, and so should they be taking time out to be training reps? The, the HSC would monitor the training of reps. The HSC would not be uh, training reps. The HSC, HSC will involve, uh, discuss, and share everything they do offshore with safety reps. But it's no with it. The HSCs, remember, are there to regulate the, and make sure everything is in place and the place is getting run as safe as it is uh, supposed to be. They've not done the safety case. But it's not a thing for HSE uh, to be training people. Yeah. On the, the bad side of things, you know, I think there's a, a part for the workforce to play in ensuring their safety reps are delivered good. Absolutely. And it's, it's hold your safety rep to account. You know, I mean, you, you, you're elected to look after your interests, just like MPs are elected supposedly to look after our interests. So you, you hold your rep to account. You ask your rep to provide feedback. You ask your rep to give you information and share that information on issues that you feel are important to you. So there's a, there's a, there's a means of holding reps to account to make them either good yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that the workforce themselves, you know, they, they should try to educate themselves a bit on what good looks like in terms of a safety rep, which is why we're having these webinars, you know, and, and if they can find out what their safety reps should be doing for them or what is expected of them, then they can ask them, you know, what, what have you done? What Have you, you know, sorted a few things out? Or, you know, where have you got to with your committees? Are you trained enough? You know, do, you, do we need to put... Um, you know, more training in, in place for you. And I think all these things are, are incredibly relevant. But like Jake says, the workforce, you know, it's really important for the workforce to understand what a safety rep should be doing. Yeah, I would completely agree with that, actually. We quite often have um, people saying that the, the workforce are only coming to them with uh, welfare issues, you know, not enough Rice Krispies kind of issue, rather than genuine issues. Uh, a, but, good, a good rep, should be able to communicate that correct. part? I mean, uh, the, the, the classic one I always refer to a few years ago was uh, the guys coming in and saying, well, it's no safe to work in the leg, but if the geese three years overtime, it'll be okay. Yes. Come on. That's no, that doesn't no, work safe. No. I think it comes in under ugly. Exactly. <laughs> and it's understanding, understanding the welfare side as well, because it's health, safety, and welfare yes. for safety reps. Mm -hmm. you know, so there is welfare in there, as in privacy, room sizes, cabins, uh, uh, yeah. lockups, and like things it, like that. Yeah. It's not. A, unfortunately, it isn't the speed of Wi-Fi. It isn't the what Sky TV television. channels you've yeah, got. Again, so, right? But it's the workforce need educated, but then so do refs, and uh, so does the employers. The whole thing, yeah. So I'd like to run a couple more polls. Oh, sorry, Emily, you got something? I do have one last question. Uh, do the panel think safety reps have concerns about being honest with their HSC inspectors? Do, do we think that safety reps have concerns? About being honest with the HSC inspectors? In, in, in my experience, no. No, not in my experience. But maybe Bob would be best to answer that because he it, inspects with the HSC. It depends. I, I could see where the question's yeah. coming from, yeah. as in if they tell the HSC too much, come back. Uh, is it going yeah. to come back and want them? Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. There may be that. We would hope there shouldn't be that. And as part of that, we would support, and part of the support and the safety reps is the protection of safety reps. For safety reps highlighting safety issues, it cannot be held against them. And if they have got an issue, they're entitled under the law to report it to their trade union. And the trade union can go and report it to the HFC on their behalf. So there's other means to get their issues to the HSC if there's any apprehension. There's also an anonymous um, yeah, side yeah. of it as well that you can, you, that you know, safety reps can use. And we, they shouldn't have to use that, but I can see where Bob's coming from. I can understand where the question has come from. Um, but yeah, and it um, does hopefully get, we're trying to get rid of all that kind of thing. It shouldn't be anonymous, it should be open. You shouldn't be able to. It does get used. It does get used uh, with an HSC. Uh, not that. Uh, it's not that common, but it certainly isn't uncommon. Yeah, okay.
Right, I'm going to do a couple more polls. We'll do one for bad. Are you given enough time to carry out your functions? No. All right, no. no. Scrap that. <laughs> Let's do the other one. Has the industry... Happy? Yes, that one. <laughs> Has the industry got the safety reps, committees it wants, needs, or deserves? So there's three answers to that. It has the one it wants, it has the one it needs, or it has the one it deserves. So what do you think about that, Bob? Um, it's good to find nobody. Yeah, yeah. It's good to the other exactly. Yeah. Because, because the regulations have been in place that long, and it's still, and not all places, because there's some very, very good examples out there uh, where it all works great. But there is still cases where the regulations are certainly not being followed. The involvement of the reps is not happening the way it could happen. The involvement of the safety committee or even holding safety committee meetings uh, isn't happening. Um, so that, I would say, is that because that's what the duty holder wants on that uh, place? Because the regulations have been there that long. Maybe that, that is what they want, which is want quite an active safety reps and an active safety committees. Or if it's all running good, then maybe that's what they need there. Mm. That is what they need there. Is yeah. it what they deserve? <laughs> well, it's been in place coming up for 28 years. Uh, so if you feel it is the running well, what are you doing to not make it the one you deserve? Yeah. Do you agree with that, Jay? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, they are what they are. I mean, I keep hearing about tweaking the regs. I'd rather just see the regs applied, as, as I said earlier. You know, if, you, if you use the guidance on officer isolation, safety, and safety committee regulations, if you use that guidance, and specifically, as I said earlier, 1617, and you use that as your Bible, this is what you're about, and you educate your constituent, you educate management, but this is what you are empowered to do, these are your functions, you'll go over. Is that okay. correct? 33% has the one it wants, 33% has the one it needs, 33% has the one it deserves. Really? Aye. Yes. Is that from three so people? What's the other one? 86% voted. Wow. What's the other 1% one? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, right, we'll do one more poll before we move on. Uh, okay, are you given enough time to carry out your functions as a safety rep, obviously? Um, yes, I have enough. No, I want more. No, I want less. Um, I think sometimes, I don't know if it's the same with you, if you experience the same thing, but Rather than doing it in your 12 hour day, you're kind of expected to do it in your own time. I know some, some places actually pay overtime to safety reps to do that. What do you think about that? Well, I, disag yeah. I disagree with the idea of overtime. I mean, especially the, the payment hour. of overtime. Well, no, not so much the payment of overtime as, as doing it out with your normal working day. I mean, we're now doing, a lot of guys are now doing 21 days. And I don't think overtime. Should be overtime on any kind. And 12 hours for 21 days is, is more than enough if we're genuinely going to be looking after occupational health and safety. And I think it sends you other messages that you don't have the time to fulfil your role during the working time. So I think there should be time set aside. As I said earlier, when we were doing it, because it was a big platform, a big constituent, a big group of reps, we had a duty rep. And the duty rep did all that. Safety reps functions. Okay. Um, smaller installations, sometimes because it's smaller, smaller operations, then you, you, you do get that time. Mm -hmm. But the time should be afforded. I mean, it's quite clear and again in the regulations. I think it's the commitment it's, from the exactly. operator as well. Exactly. Like commitment, well holder, commitment from the supervisors, yeah. commitment, from, yeah. commitment from them. Okay, there's your, you get your two hours to go and do your functions, yeah. and it, yeah. it shows that they are committed to the committee and the safety reps as well. It's a powerful think? message. Yeah. 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 Certainly here from the delegates that it depends on, on what your role is, how easy is, is it for them to actually afford you that time in your normal working day, uh, particularly if you're on a small crew, 
it's a very active small crew and there's, there's not very many people to go around, it's much more difficult for them to actually give you the time off uh, to actually do your functions. And the difficulty now is with a lot of the cutbacks that have been in the industry, uh, there's less people a lot of the time there's just as just as much work to be done or more work to be done depending on what it is and then you've got a safety rep within your uh, team can can the company afford them uh, time to go and do it well yes is the answer you need to plan it in and reps yeah. have got the powers to go and do it and yeah. the only reason they've got that is to make the place better better safety, better morale, better morale, better production, mm-hmm. it, it should be seen as that. It should be seen as the so way of helping, yeah. uh, helping the whole uh, uh, duty holder uh, mm-hmm. producing more. Yeah. I think there's another, there's another aspect to that as well, that when you've got that time off, you've got to demonstrate what you're doing with that time. Mm-hmm. This is the old capability yeah. thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if you go away to do a survey, you've got away to do minutes, then You've got to be able to see them. You've got to be produced, yeah. and everybody can see. Yeah. Yeah. Most reps do do a lot oh. in their own time. It, it just, it just happens. Yeah. You'll be sitting there at eight o'clock at night, and some pops in your head. You'll, you'll go and you, you'll go and maybe add it to uh, an agenda, or uh, you will end up doing minutes in about your own time. But there's a bit of give and take. If it's always going to be all in your own time as a volunteer. Volunteers will very soon get fed up doing that. Results are in. 36% say yes, they have enough time. And 64% say no, they want more. Luckily, nobody wants less. I thought that might be the case. And I have a follow up question. Why do you think that less of the workforce wants to become safety reps? Right now, Monal. Right now, yeah, yeah. I think it's just that the, the whole climate right now doesn't lend itself to. That's why we're doing this to uh, better engagement and better commitment and enthusiasm. Yeah. And if you keep getting, I suppose it's a bit cynical, but if you keep getting kicked, um, you're not going to give. You're just not going to give. And we, we see it now. We, which is why we're doing the webinars. We can't get people to turn up to meetings. Because they're not prepared to sacrifice their time off. You know, we're we very much reliant on that that goodwill yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the time because this is a voluntary role. And I think it's just in one hour at this moment. Which is a shame. It is a shame because it's not necessarily a safer time. No. Right? It, uh, so, yeah. Um, it would be good to get more volunteers, which, like Jake says, it's why we're doing these, these webinars and trying to promote, and, and that's why I'm here. You know, hopefully I can get out, get offshore, and get the system promoted and get it doing what it's, it was intended to do in the spirit of it, get it going again. Um, okay, so we'll move now. Emily, sorry. Sorry, I've got one more question. That. <laughs> one more question. How does Safety Reps make up from the core crew reach out to transit workers, for example, TAR campaign teams? Uh, follow Regulation 15, and when you're bringing a big team out there, have their safety reps within that team. Uh, that team then coming out for shutdowns, turnarounds, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call them, or large uh, construction projects, uh, lays with the Offshore Safety Committee beforehand. You consult HSE, uh, that that's what you're doing, and it is supported. So, you're then getting that transient workforce with reps that could be organised from the employers, because you certainly have usually a lot of uh, transient workforce that will be coming out, which will fall in uh, the 40 uh, people to be in a constituency, and you can have them. You can have them as your safety rep, and in that short space of time. So there's stuff in the regulations to support that. People are not sure, just look at Regulation 15, ASI 971, and the guidance will tell you how you can do it. Yeah. And One more question. Finally, to follow up on the poll question about adequate time, in Australia they're required to give the ESR equivalent of four hours per 
pitch, which is a two week rota. Two weeks, or two hours a week, I think it is, yeah. Would that work in the UK as good practice? Some companies do that. I think, I think yes, it would. I think if you know, at the moment it's reasonable time. So I think that uh, to be given a, a defined amount of time, I mean, it, it is ambiguous. So I mean, some people will, will need to use that time. Some people won't. It really depends on the installation. Depends on what kind of work they're doing. But to be given an actual amount of time would be helpful, certainly. I think. And let the safety committee control that, because yeah. that's made up all your safety reps. So mm -hmm. with OIM involved and A and other, usually the safety advisor, but it's up to the OIM to appoint another pe person. So let them govern that. Yeah. But if you're getting that time with safety reps or you're involving some of the workers in that, uh, produce something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll move on to what is just downright ugly. Um, fuck me. Fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope to see so the yeah. irony in calling That's me out. That's irony, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're calling a tall man tiny. Uh, um, right, so if you could send in your questions now about uh, what is absolutely ugly. And there's a few things in there. There's a particular word in there that I'm interested to see if you anybody gets. So I'll hope it into us. So, yeah. Unapproachable with an attitude. Have you ever met a rep like that before? I know uh, Dave Thompson at his presentation the other night was talking about that very thing, and he showed a wee film about it and uh, how the, you know reps can be seen as police and can be seen. And uh, you know, I've never experienced that personally. But has anybody experienced that? Oh, I. Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean. It's this whole thing about commitment and enthusiasm and, and what your your objectives and your goals are. If, you, if you're genuinely elected and you're genuinely facilitating that representative role, then you're doing what you're supposed to do. That is representing the people that elected you and taking their issues. But unfortunately, the, like any role, there's people that get involved because they've got a specific issue. And they've got this thing in their minds that they're going to pursue forever and ever and ever. And it's like an illness. Mm -hmm. Some it really is. And I mean, I've got, I've had them come into our office and complain that HSE is letting them down, the operators are letting them down, the employers are letting them down, because things as they turned out the way they expected to. Okay. You're never going to win every argument, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all about as low as reasonably practical. It's all about with it getting in the legislation. So you cannot, as a rep, expect to get your own way all the time. And unfortunately, there's a few people think they should. Yeah, I think from the unapproachable point of view as well, and, and it's in 99% or maybe more of cases, there's a perception that where the supervisor is the safety rep, that that's, that makes them slightly unapproachable because what hat are they wearing when, when the workforce are coming to them? Is it management or safety there? Well, that, that, we'll get to that in a sec. That's yeah. a poll we're going to run short. But, uh, sorry. I have a question then. As the panel, would you agree or disagree that safety in the North Sea is going backwards? It's a good question. Well, I'll jump on it <laughs> because I'm expecting that I'll be expected to respond. Um, the statistics, and I hate statistics, the statistics would suggest no. But the anecdotal evidence, that is, the complaints, the morale, the issues, the suggestion that things are being covered up, etc., suggests it is. But in the absence of evidence, and in the absence of anybody even putting that evidence in front of me, um, I can only say that I, I, I don't see it. I don't physically see it. I feel it. I, th I think it is. But from a, from my point of view, you know there are there are certain things that need to be reined in. Paperwork, for example, I know that that's an issue out offshore. Um, you know the the reason for paperwork was to focus the mind on the hazard of the task, not to focus the mind on how much paperwork you need and what kind of paperwork you are required to do that task. And I think that that's certainly become an issue. Um, thankfully, you know step change are trying to you know 
do something about that with our standardization at the moment. Um, but that is a recognized problem throughout, I'm pretty sure, the entire North Sea here. Um, so that, that could be a safety concern. You know, using tools that have been um, developed to keep people safe, observations and things, we've had this webinar before, have they become a numbers game? You know, are they being used as tools in the briefcase of the salesman rather than tools for HSE purposes? I'm pretty sure we all know the answer to that in some cases. Um, so yeah, I, I, whether it's going backwards or not, I, you know, like Jake says, that there's no evidence to suggest that, and the only evidence really suggests that it is it is better. Um, well, yeah, I, I would uh, agree with both, both the comments. There is nothing to say uh, safety has gone backwards. Uh, as in proven, I would say, speaking to a large number of new reps and existing reps all over the place, there is certainly a perception that uh, it's uh, it's not as good as it was. Whether it was it's going backwards, uh, I don't know. But it's certainly something we need to be willing to be challenged on. Uh, but I would say, over the piece, I, I, I don't, it's not going backwards. I mean, I'm very much a black and white, you know, I mean, I hate all the grey stuff. Um, the hard stats tell you, just look at fatalities, major injuries. You know, we were killing two or three people every year during the early 90s. Before that, well, the day you go fuck that far back, we're not doing that now. You know, major injuries and fatalities are down. Major events, explosions, fires, etc., are down. But the minor incidents, the, the wee things that niggle people, are probably up. And I, I expect a lot of them are being suppressed and covered up, or people have been disappointed and dismissed, um, which we've seen a lot more of as well. But um, going backwards, no, I can't agree. No, no. Are we as far along as we should be? Possibly not. No. Maybe that's a different question. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of near backwards. misses happening. There's still a lot of near misses with high potential uh, uh, things happening out there. But the barriers are working. They're not finding that spark. Uh, or uh, it's no getting as yeah. much released as probably could have been released. So, Emily. Question. Step Change have done very good work in the North Sea. Oh, thanks. But does the panel think that Step Change ethos and the contribution is becoming a power word for management and is said and not implemented? No. No, I wouldn't say that. Well, I can only go by my own experience again. But maybe I'm not the right person to ask that question because I work for Step Change. So <laughs> maybe we'll give that to. Uh, yeah, go, well, on. I'll, go on then, Jay. Well, I think there's some. Some substance to that, because you know you've got lots and lots of member companies um, who sit around the table supporting everything that we're doing and, and saying that they're buying into everything that we're doing. But in reality, they're not. Um, the managers that are in the room um, are one hundred percent committed. I've no doubt about that. But by the time it filters down through to those different levels to the, to the sites, I don't think that support and involvement or engagement of step change uh, objectives is, is being adhered to or is being supported as it should be. I think it could be, we take, you, you mentioned that simplification standardization, mm -hmm. something like that could could be a game changer for this industry. You know, I mean, we've been hearing for 10 years more about a common permanent work system. I think that could be another game changer for the industry. But I mean, something as simple as the Workforce Engagement Toolkit. It's only been applied by two operators in the last year. It's there free of charge for every operator to use. It's only been used twice. And I think that speaks volumes of how much uptake there is for some of the stuff that step changes to do. So, yeah, I think there's some substance to that, to that point. Okay. Should we do another poll? Yeah, let's do another poll. Yeah, I'll just do another poll. Where am I ugly? Should I promote it? Yes, yeah. Okay, this is a. <laughs> should a promoted position supervisor be an elected safety rep? 
Yes, no, don't know. Cha. <laughs> Aileen? Um, <laughs> technically speaking, there's, there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be. Um, it perhaps, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, it puts a small barrier between the general workforce and the supervisor thinks when they're, when they're approaching that person with a safety concern or a health concern, is it, are they wearing their supervisor's hat or their safety net's hat? Um, how you get around that is very difficult if we're in a situation where the workers are not wanting to stand up and be elected themselves. Somebody has to do it and if the supervisor is, is keen and wants to um, look after the people uh, that he's supervising as well, then why not? But it is a diff it's a difficult one to, to get right. It's a conflict of interest. Yes, yeah. exactly. That is, uh, that is a difficult one. And the, the regulations do not stop safe supervisors uh, being safety reps. What the regulations do through the guidance numerous times mention that safety reps are not part of the management system. So therein lies a bit of conflict but also within the guidance and the regulations as you can set up supervisor constituencies so a supervisor can have their, uh, have their own safety rep. I mean, I started off uh, as a safety rep on the, on the tools uh, and ended up as a foreman and through speaking of my constituents they still wanted me to be their safety rep and I was quite happy, happy to do so. I would like to think I didn't have to wear two hats uh, and I was able to, uh, I wouldn't be asking people to do things that were considered unsafe, mm -hmm. but maybe certain uh, individuals that, that may not be the case and it can be perceived to be the case because the reps have to be the representatives of the workforce if you go by the, le the legislation. Uh, the supervisors are obviously part of that workforce, but the, the key thing for me is it clearly states that super, uh, safety reps are not part of the management system. So if you're a supervisor, if, you're, if your constituents want you to do it, great. But you really have, have to watch, watch that one. It is a tricky question. The legislation says that, like you said, that the, the Consideration should be given to supervisors or managers having their own constituency. What would be the benefit of that, do you think? Well, the benefit is they'll have their own they'll have their own issues. They'll have their own issues of getting pressure for probably uh, maybe the duty holder or onshore management that they're considering uh, could impact on safety. Uh, or they may be getting pressure for the workforce who they feel are not acting safely. Uh, on large projects, see, it, it would depend on the size of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, on an installation that's got a POB of 30, 40, 50, 60, it would be, it would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I have came across where I would say it was good practice, supervisors had their uh, own supervisor constituency and elected safety rep within that supervisor constituency. And the rest of the safety reps didn't want that constituency represented at the safety committee. So it was like, okay. yeah. you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's certainly, and they're entitled to be there. And it, yeah. it's, that's the bond that trying to get everybody to work together. But I mean, the, the, the nature of the election should present the, the correct safety rep for that constituency, shouldn't it? I mean, that should, if it's set up properly. Yeah, if you set the constituency yeah. up properly, you've got to get, like A, you want to do it, B, uh, somebody uh, nominates you and then somebody seconds, seconds uh, you, then it should work. Yeah. I think, I mean, I hear a lot that supervisors are safety reps are unapproachable, but I think it all depends on the supervisors. I mean, I think it does depend on the yeah. individual because if, if the individuals, if the individual can cope with the, the sitting between that rock and a hard place because they've got to deliver on productivity, they've got to deliver on time, they've got to deliver on budget, but they've also got to deliver as a rep and represent the workforce's concerns. That at times, for a 
a manager not up to it, a supervisor not up to it, could probably be too much and would prevent the detour on the road. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's, yeah, there's getting that information out there on. Uh, should I say what good looks like? Uh, another thing that oh, well, steps like in uh, our uh, development as part of the West Group, and the first stage is getting that information out to the the, the whole workforce, for the people who own the oil companies, uh, to the people that are working on their assets, whoever that employs them. It's making everybody understand what the reps are, what the benefits of having these, these and they, they're hugely valuable. No, no question about it. Was up 56% of people have said yes, a promoted person should be an ESR, 28% have said no, and 17% don't know. And I've had a follow up question. Um, in the opinion of the panel, what characteristics make a good safety net? Well, I think we've got a few on the old slide there, haven't we? Organised, open, accountable, balanced. <laughs> Well, reasonable, um, trustworthy, feeding back to your constituents. Remember, your primary role as a safety rep is your constituents. You will have so much easier and better life as a safety rep if you continually feed back and gain the trust and represent the people that you're, you're primarily there to represent uh, and be open and honest with them. Your life will be so much easier. I don't think I can add anything to that. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious for me anyway, what, what makes a good set. And that is the primary thing, isn't it? You're going to get the support, you're going to get the trust, you're going to get the respect, you're going to get all that kind of stuff. If you're, if you're actually an active safety rep doing your safety rep functions and you're reporting that back to your constituents and reporting that back to the rig and the management and who I am and everybody else, you know, then you'll gain that respect and you'll get that momentum that's required to, to make a good safety committee and to make good safety reps and, and yeah, communication and communication. If you give the time, you give the training, you give the trust, you'll get a good rep. Mm -hmm. And if you're the constituents and they are getting that and that is not a good rep, then you can challenge them. They may be representing you. A question came in earlier on which could work here. Um, in previous years, been offshore as HSC advisor, I've always supported the SI971 reps, acted as a link between the reps and the asset through facilitating meetings and phone calls. Do the panel see benefit in the asset HSEA support, or should that be left between the reps and the asset in order to push and develop them? Do you know, again, it depends on the HSE person, I think. I really, um, some find huge value in, in this SI971 safety reps, some find them threatening, some find them, you know, just they're not really interested in them, but some support them hugely, you know, and I've experienced it all. Yeah. So, yeah, it really depends on how that person sees the committee. And again, it depends on how the committee see them as well yeah. and how the committee have earned the respect of, of you know, not just I think the health safety guy, but everybody on board, as Bob yeah. just mentioned. I held a, a constituency safety meeting offshore, which I invited the HSE inspectors to attend. And two inspectors come along and sat in at the meeting, just to see how the meeting went. And they came out of the meeting and the comment was, um, it was a great meeting until the HSE advisor got up and spoke, and then just died. <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, it depends on the HSE <laughs> advisor. It does, but in reality, why would it not be a good yeah. Why would it not be? Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, let's go to that poll, actually, shall we? The good um, HSC advisor worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, which one was it? Where am I? Oh, that one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. one. Right, so if we can have this another poll, uh, this is on ugly, but it could be anywhere, really. When reporting a safety concern, is your ESR your first point of contact? Yes or no? Should it be the first point of contact? Well, most companies, sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 most companies. I'll wait for the good. Uh, most, most companies. <laughs> most, uh, no, I uh, most companies will say they're the line manager. And uh, when somebody, something's raised within HSE, we will ask, have you, 
uh, highlighted this through your company procedures, which will generally say first your line manager. But if you feel you want to do it through your safety rep, then do that. Your safety rep can be your first point of contact. Uh, because unfortunately, some of the times, it may be the line manager that you feel is causing the safety issues. Mm -hmm. So if you're raising it with them, then it may be a bit awkward. So the first point of contact in a good culture should be uh, your line manager or supervisor. But you're more than entitled to be the safety rep to be the first point of uh, contact. And it should never be discouraged that the safety rep can be the first uh, point of contact when it comes to safety. I think it I think it shouldn't matter. Because when it does matter you've got a problem. You know, I say that because I've I've represented contractor employees who have gone to the OIM and said, I'm coming to you with this issue because it's been raised and then the OIM reacts and says, Right, okay, well look into this and then it gets back to the contractors contract guys, employers, and they see that as going out with the line and bringing the company into disrepute. But the, the, the problem they've got there is that the OIM invariably turns up at the meeting every Sunday and tells everybody, my door's always open. So how can you be accused of going out with the line when the OIM actively yeah. encourages you to do that as well? You know, so I, I, I think you should be able to go to the safety awesome. rep, to your line manager, to the duty holder, to whoever you think is appropriate without the fear of domination. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. 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 So the, and that's the key, isn't it? If it comes to the safety net as a first port of call, then the safety net has to really understand what the nature of the problem is and um, so that they don't shoot themselves in the foot effect. Yeah. 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 Results are in. Results are in. I'm not sure that this has happened because 13% have said yes and 88% have said no. So 101% <laughs> responded. <laughs> Interesting. That would be that 1% from the face. <laughs> 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 Just carried over. That's interesting. Okay. So the vast majority are saying they can go to the supervisor. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good culture. Yeah. 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 So have we got one poll left. Is that the last one? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're going to do the last poll. We'll do that now and we'll have a, a chat around that. We've got time. Yeah. Do you feel managers, supervisors should have their own constituency? So we discussed this a bit earlier on, but we'd like to get your views on that. So one for yes, two for no. We've talked about this already. I would right? say it depends on the size. It depends on the size and the amount of people. Uh, that are on there, mm -hmm. I would say, because it, if it's a short, like say, 30, 40, 50, 60 POV, it would, it would be very difficult. The thing is, you're, you're now seeing you know, the changes that are currently going on because of the current climate, that that whole middle tier of management, contractor supervisors has been taken out a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So you've got the contract workforce who are now accountable or responsible to the client supervisor. So they're already in a constituency of like, and, and the duty holders constituency of the thought. So I must admit in, in my experience that we had several, you know, supervisors in in the safety committee and they definitely didn't have their supervisor hats on when they were being safety mm -hmm. reps. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about the duties under the Health and Safety at Work Act? asks Alyssa. Who's duties under the health and safety? Or supervisor. Or provide well, training to the. the that, that's duty that, of care, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, there shouldn't be people in danger. I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't know what the question means. I think, from my point of view, the important thing is that the supervisors are entitled to be represented in the same way as anybody else. And if they have issues, then whether they're in a um, supervisory constituency, or they're a member of another constituency, they have a right to a voice on the committee. Absolutely, the same as absolutely everybody else on that, 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 that place of work. It's what makes the offshore different for any place else. You're all out there together. If something goes wrong, it goes wrong quickly. For and, and for everyone. You know, it does not respect pay grades or boiler suits or uh, 
what type of heart heart you've got, and it, it's going to affect everybody. So that's the difference sometimes with the offshore industry and the onshore industry, where the avenues and the offices and certain maybe off site and certain you're all there. You're all there as one one group. If it goes wrong, it'll affect everybody. Yeah. Results. Results. 29% have said yes, manager and supervisor should have their own constituency, which means 71% have said no. As long as they're represented, I suppose, it's, it's, you know, it's neither here nor there. I don't think it suggests to me that the workforce field that supervisor should, should be encompassed yeah. in the whole yes. thing. Yeah. 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 I think concerns, yeah. especially we spoke with Teague the last time, and I've had concerns raised to me about workers concerned about the pressure sure. and fatigue that their supervisors are putting on. Yeah. Well, yeah, and exactly. also, it's no an us and them yeah. uh, yeah. attitude by most people. Sorry, Again, I'm everybody cares. I'm just getting something in from the producer. <laughs> the producer. So I'm coming in your earpiece. It was, yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, what's that? Um, yeah, just the word on the ugly one was kitchen. If anybody noticed it, and by kitchen I mean that people doing training courses to buy a new kitchen with the money that they get from the training course, or a holiday for that. So that is ugly. That is very ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Two closing Two questions. Yeah. The first one is a big one. Who is the GA team? How can I join, and how do I find out more? Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the GA team are eighteen. Well, we're kind of G fourteen at the moment, but we're G eighteen are uh, a group of safety reps from right across the North Sea, different installations who um, communicate and try and improve uh, in the connections between the safety committees of offshore. And uh, yes, you can join and yes, you can contact me and it will be put to an application process sort of process, and um, you can go from there. So just join. Onshore as well. Onshore as well. You've also got uh, onshore. Uh, people part of the G team. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and you know, safety reps in particular. So if you could just contact Step Change and we will uh, take that forward for you. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking for. I think we're looking for four G18 at the moment, actually. So. It'd be good, and it's trying to get people for all aspects of the industry, mm. all jobs in the industry, the southern sector. We we'll always seem to struggle on. As long as uh, also the Irish Sea side, but there is representation from uh, onshore sites, also in the high hazard industry, your coma sites. So it's not specifically just for uh, flying out Aberdeen people. We want as many yeah. people from all over uh, the oil and gas industry to be involved in that. Yeah, it gives us a better overall idea of what's going on out there and how we can, you know, use good what looks good and, and make these things happen and learn and yeah so yeah and finally yeah jake you've mentioned the general election a few times who are you voting for <laughs> <laughs> well 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 who do you vote for because you, you can't pick between them right now but um having watched the politics show this morning i'm more convinced about what i'm going to do but that Thanks will remain much. a complete secret <laughs> right i think uh, we'll wind it up there Hang on a sec. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're ready to go. Thank you very much for uh, dialing in. And uh, yeah, G18, come and give us a shout. Get me offshore if you can, please. I'm um, quite happy to come pretty much anywhere. Uh, so yeah, I'll shamelessly promote that again. Thanks for to, to the panel and especially Aileen for coming in today. So. Aye. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.